Welcome to Color Country Politics, where we discuss all the important political issues facing Iron County, Utah. Our guests include elected officials and community leaders in or representing Iron County. My name is Jesse Harris. Um, uh, today we have our special guests, uh, Senator Evan Vickers and Representative John Westwood. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us today. Well, thanks for having us. Thanks so today you. we're going to go ahead and discuss the various ballot proposition questions that are out there. Uh, first one that's out there is the one about uh, the, the one about the gas tax increase. Uh, as I understand it, the idea is we're asking everyone. Would you like us to increase the gas tax so we can put more money toward education? Is that roughly the gist of it? It is. You know, John, you want to start? Sure. Um, it is. Uh, ten cents of uh, increasing the gas tax by ten cents. Seven cents of that would go towards education. And that's what they're hoping to get is an additional amount towards education. Third, uh, three cents would go then towards improving our road conditions. So yes, it is an overall 10%, 10 cents increase in the gas tax. And as I understand, there have been some other gas tax increases over the last few years, correct? Right. We we increased the gas tax recently for by a nickel a couple of years ago, but that's actually the first time in a long time. The To give you a little background, it used to be that the gas tax covered everything. It covered all the road maintenance, both local, county, and state as well as paying for the highway patrol. It no longer does that. Uh, there's not enough money coming in from the gas tax to cover those things. So there are monies coming out of the general fund and quite frankly, the education fund going into transportation. So the concept behind this question is, is that if we were to raise the gas tax by the 10 cents, then a portion of that, and they estimate somewhere around 130 to $150 million a year, would go into transportation and replace that with the idea that that money would come back out of transportation and go into education. And why is it being phrased as a question rather than a straight up, once this passes, it's the law? So some additional background. Uh, last year, we had the Our Schools Now initiative that was going forward. And in this session, during the session, there was some significant uh, negotiations that went on. That, that would have raised numerous taxes and to the total of about 750 to 800 million dollars a year. Oh, so sorry. <laughs> oh, that's the, that's the kind of thing so that sorry. happens. <laughs> sorry about that. No but worries. I apologize. Uh, to the tune of about 750 to 800 million dollars a year, there was negotiations with that group that if we did certain things, and one of them was to put significant more money into education, we did that last year. And quite frankly, over the last three years, we put upwards of a billion dollars in dollars. new money into public education. And that's ongoing money. That is ongoing money. And then with that, was they asked for this question to be put on the ballot. Okay. And so if it passes, then the legislature would go back and then presumably pass the, the gas tax increase and then reallocate some money around, correct? That's that's correct. Okay. I, I have seen uh, a lot of confusion about it. A lot of people don't quite understand the mechanics behind it. So it's, it's good to have an explanation out there to understand this is why we're doing it a certain way and this is what it does. It's good to understand also that that uh, billion dollars increase in public education has been there. We have uh, stepped forward and and put money towards education and everything now to increase a gas tax and uh, put more money towards education outside of the regular methods that we use is very dangerous, I think. Then what would stop other uh, groups from coming to the legislature, running a ballot initiative for um, uh, anything like... Uh, uh, any service uh, that's offered uh, and say increase the gas tax and give us some money on that and that, that shoots holes in your budget I think it would be very hard for the um, executive appropriations to take care of the budget as it, it should. And as I understand all the gas tax money has to go toward road maintenance and transportation correct? So there would be a ceiling there of once you've covered 
all transportation costs, it can't go any higher. That's true. Now, this will not, this gas tax would not, in, you know, not cover that any, in any way, shape, or form. It simply mm -hmm. replaced some money that's already going. And as I outlined earlier, that, you know, we're already in a deficit on transportation tax. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and to John's point, uh, the legislature would have con some control over that. For example, in this case, the question would not even be on the ballot if the legislature had not chosen to put it there. So you could do that through an initiative process uh, and put it on the ballot. But the, the way it was, this mechanism was done, the legislature would have to agree to it to put it on the, on the ballot. Okay. Uh, so now we'll move on to the next ballot question. This is the one that seems to stir the most controversy. Uh, the medical cannabis question that's come up. Uh, I know the proponents of it have criticized the legislature heavily saying, you're not doing enough, you're not doing it fast enough. There's, I know there's been a lot of incremental change uh, going on behind the scenes over the years. Um, what, are, what are some of the changes that, that you see um, are going to be a challenge with this ballot initiative? So you want to go or do you want me to go? <laughs> I've, uh, I've been up to my eyebrows in it, so, but go ahead. Give, I'd like to know your perspective, John, and then I'll go from there. <laughs> okay, well, the medical cannabis, yes, we have made uh, incremental steps, if you take it. I think we've been very careful as a legislature in moving forward with this issue. It's an issue that states around us have now adopted a full recreational marijuana, but uh, we have approached it on a medicinal purpose uh, only. And we're being careful. We're going through our studies that should be gone through to approve a new medicine and uh, uh, prescriptions for that medicine. We're doing our research. We're doing our background. Are we moving too slow? Um, I don't think so. I think that we're uh, methodical. I think we're taking things careful. And I think it's a chance for us to do it right. I am not for a full recreational use of marijuana. I am not. Um, and I don't see uh, uh, this initiative right now uh, raises serious questions to me about how people will obtain it, um, how they will be authorized to obtain that, how uh, what dosage they will do. Uh, smoking is permitted. It's uh, another medicine hasn't allowed smoking. So a lot of questions still to be answered. I see it as a move towards uh, people trying to get full recreational use of marijuana, and I'm not for that. If it's a medicinal purpose and we can help those that we know it will help, as we've been presented in the legislature with, then I would be for that. If we know the dosage, if we know the prescriptions, so we're not doing long-term harm to those patients right now, uh, they, they don't know what dosage to use. They don't know how, how often to use it, how fast to use it, whatever. And that's what we're doing our studies for. And it needs to be methodical. It needs to be slow. Yes. So right now it's looking like it's likely to pass. Um, given that, what do you think um, the legislature can do to make any tweaks? If What tweaks need to be made? Because it looks like it's going to happen. Yeah, let me weigh in on that because I have been in the middle of that discussion. So, you know, we've been involved in this for about four years now. Um, to be honest with you, five years ago, um, if you would ask me if Utah would be considering a medical marijuana bill, I would say no. But, of course, things transpired. Uh, Senator Madsen and the Marijuana Policy Project, Libertas and others, they were very uh, supporting that concept, uh, pushed it hard. And so there were some battles that went on in the legislature. I was involved in some of those competing bills and trying to find a path where we could provide that product to, uh, to a patient. Now we get to the point that, uh, you know, the, I guess the patients, the patient advocates, that group, the supporters of the proposition, decided that we had moved fast enough, so they put it on a ballot initiative. Uh, if you look, and so 
and as you look at polling, the polling shows that most people in the state of Utah are now favorable toward that concept. Uh, the question, though, is asking, you know, they ask you something with the fact that do you think that pe people should have access to medications that could benefit them? Well, the answer is yes. Um, a friend of mine says, really, that what they're asking is, do we feed or kill puppies? You know, <laughs> it's kind of it's kind of that kind of concept, you know. But then if you dig into the detail, the devil is always in the details of any legislation. And so, for example, myself, uh, I'm, I'm supportive of the concept. But if you look at the details of the initiative, there's some really troubling language in that. And, and usually when I point those things out, people say, oh, I, I don't want that. I don't want to do it that way. So... There, I will tell you this, that right now there's some significant discussions going on between legislative leadership, the governor's office, and even some of the advocates for the proposition in working toward a solution that would try to provide a safe medicinal product to a patient that is handled by medical professionals all the way through and in the process minimizes or eliminates the black market potential. And those are real critical elements. Um, the challenge with the initiative language is that it's being sponsored by uh, the Marijuana Policy Project, which is a national organization, which there, if you go to their website, and don't trust me, go to their website and look, and their ultimate goal is recreational marijuana in every state. And John and I totally agree. We do not agree on recreational marijuana. Do not want that in the state of Utah. Uh, the one thing we do know for a fact about marijuana usage is that consistent use by young adults destroys young minds up to the age of 25. And so you have to be, that's why we're, and that's one of the reasons we've been very methodical and careful. But I will tell you that there is some significant negotiations going on right now that hopefully would uh, put, the, put us in a position that we could bring a bill forward that soon after the November election, no matter what happens with the ballot initiative, whether it's up or down, we could move forward with meaningful uh, legislation to provide access to product. Um, former Senator Steve Urquhart has thrown kind of a bomb in the room and said, well, if we didn't do this, then nothing would happen. Do you, do you think there's any validity to that? No, but uh, Steve's off the reservation on a lot of things. And so, and he's a good, he's been a good friend of mine in the past. And uh, he's definitely, you're right, he's definitely uh, thrown some fire and some, <laughs> some gas on the fire. Uh, <laughs> but at the same token, uh, you know, there, it certainly is a driving need, gives a driving need to to pass some legislation. So whether we would be this far along in possibly having a policy by the, by in, maybe even in November without the ballot initiative, it's probably fair to say we wouldn't. But I think it's fair to say we would have some kind of a policy in the January session if we didn't. So. so you see that it's more of a case as this is accelerating the pace rather than making something happen that otherwise wouldn't. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Okay. Well, that's, um, that, that I think provides some, some good food for thought for everyone. Um, so I think too, yeah. uh, if I may, uh, before we leave that uh, subject, it's still um, against a federal law. Uh, you know, uh, our banks in Utah cannot accept that money. Uh, it's going to cost taxpayers money to get that set up and everything, as the initiative is written right now. And that's a big concern, I know, to the Salt Lake Chamber, to our Chamber of Commerce throughout the state. It's a big concern, taxpayers, increasing tax on taxpayers as well. Probably ought to say, and, and if people ask me about it, I always say this. I say, if, you, if everyone knew what I know about the, the language in the, in the initiative, you would never vote for it. And quite frankly, if that that language and that initiative was brought before the legislature right now, it would go down in flames because it's just not appropriate language. There's multiple issues with the language. But that also is an impetus to try to make some modifications and, and change it and try to improve it. Do you see that uh, any members of our federal delegation are looking at taking action to make it so that it does ease the process of allowing medical marijuana in our state? Yeah, there has been some efforts. Hatch has made some efforts, uh, Stewart and, and Lee. Uh, both Stewart and Bishop came out opposed to the initiative. And uh, you, yeah, so you'll see some, some efforts going on to primarily to reschedule it from a one to a two, class one to a two. And, mm. and that's kind of a a detailed thing and take a little bit too much time here today, but it, uh, it would make a difference in 
and the way the research could be done on that and probably uh, try to have me more of an impetus toward having something done nationally. All right, excellent. Um, so the third ballot question is coming up is about Medicaid expansion. Um, mm -hmm. This one, uh, it kind of pulled the gun away to say, because the question that everyone always asks about Medicaid expansion is how is the state going to pay for its share? And it said very clearly, well, here's a sales tax increase that's going to pay for it. You know, that's how we're doing it. Uh, so I understand that, you know, the legislature spent a lot of time going back and forth on it, trying to get a Medicaid waiver, trying to find ways to, to cover it. A lot of concerns about cost. Um, do you think the sales tax increase that's built into the ballot question is going to cover actual costs? Um, I don't know that. Uh, that's unknown. Uh, I think, uh, as other states have experienced, when they've expanded to a full medication, Medicaid expansion, they've seen many more people sign up for that, costing the state many uh, millions of dollars to cover that and causing a lot of trouble with their budgets. Uh, so, uh, no, I don't. John's absolutely right. Uh, the studies do show that states that have expanded under the Obama administration's plan, which is what this is, it's full Medicaid expansion up to 138% of the federal uh, poverty limit. Um, you always have the woodwork effect and you find that what whatever your projections are, you know, double or triple them and that's what you end up with. So. This, the federal government does pay for a significant portion of that, but there is some significant cost to the state. So the, the sales tax that's included in the in the ballot initiative uh, would not cover those costs. I'm pretty I'm 100 percent sure in saying that. So if we get into it, we find the costs are higher than what the initiative pays for. What then? We could to go back to the taxpayers and say, you get to pay an additional tax uh, for that. I don't know. That's mm -hmm. uh, that's scary. Currently, Medicaid is a third of our budget. Uh, public education is a third of our budget. And so the, uh, the rest is, is a third. Uh, if you see I, from other states' experience, I'm pretty safe in saying that if you see this initiative pass, in the next five to eight years, you'll see Medicaid at about 40% of our budget. Wow. That, that sounds like a pretty large increase. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything that can be done to try and control costs? Because right now it's looking pretty good that it's going to pass. Mm -hmm. And so obviously, the, you know, that's another one of those cases of, well, if it's likely to pass, what then? It's really interesting because this exact bill has been introduced in the legislature for the last three years. And it's never even got out of committee. That that tells you how troubling the concern is about. And, and hey, let's face it: we're a conservative state. We're a conservative legislature. We actually are really concerned about how much money we spend and how much money we can bring in. And, and so we're always concerned about driving, you know, up ongoing costs. So it it's a challenge. There's no getting around it. But the fact of the matter is, once it's in place, it's full Medi uh, Obamacare, Medicaid expansion, and so you're really pretty well tied to it. So there's there's no, oh, wait, never mind, we don't want this anymore. That would be very hard to offer full Medicaid expansion and then come back a year later and say, oh, to your little families or whatever that have qualified have the Medicaid expansion in their pockets and say, we're going to take that back, sorry. One of the compelling and interesting facts about Medicaid expansion in other states is that in many of the states, upwards of 85% of the people that new people that qualify under this proposed Medicaid expansion end up being single, able-bodied working adults. And for, you know, it's one thing to cover those that cannot afford insurance and just have no way of doing that. That's one thing. That's what Medicaid's designed for. And there would be a portion of those people in the new new population that would cover that be covered by that, but many of the people that fall into this category are those that basically choose not to either work or not or they're able and, and to work but they choose not to, and so that's a, a concept that's a really a troubling concept. And now we're insuring people that really could but they won't. So with the government's here to take care of them, I guess. And we've tried uh, over the years uh, working and negotiating 
with our federal government on Medicaid expansion and everything. And one of the sticky issues was we wanted the people to work that are able to work. And uh, the administration back then did not want that to happen. They wanted it. And that would hurt businesses. That would hurt businesses because businesses then would have to limit the hours for that working individual. And as Evan brought up, that would be counterproductive for our businesses within our state. As I understand, um, the waiver has been pretty stalled, even with the Trump administration now. Um, has there been any reason that they've given for that? I, you know, I actually have to admit I'm not privy to that, you know, that discussion. I know that the, the basically the waiver has been turned down. The waiver request has been turned down, but I'm not sure of the details. Okay. Well, then we'll, we'll go on to the final question. Um, that is to establish an independent redistricting committee. Uh, the idea being that they will create plans that, to give to the legislature for an up or down vote. Um, I know Senator Weiler has been pretty vocal that he believes that this is likely an unconstitutional measure because the Constitution vests the power for drawing maps with the legislature. Um, it looks like it has a pretty good chance of passage. What, if, what do you see happening if it passes? Well, so for example, um, I think one of the reasons that the Medicaid expansion and this particular initiative have gained so much ground is because the the marijuana initiative has sucked all the air out of the room. You know, <laughs> that's fair. You know, it's taken up all the all the the air time on. Um, so this one is probably more right and left than any of the others. You know, the Medicaid expansion is close, but this is more of a right versus a left issue. And let me explain that. Um, across the country, there is movement in many states to try to implement this type of legislation. And the reason is, is that the Republicans control the majority, vast majority of the state legislatures and, and governorships. And the left, uh, especially the you know, the, the hardcore Democratic left, the liberal left, is moving towards trying to equalize that. And they found that this is a method that can work that way. And so by doing this, you know, Senator Weiler is correct. The, by constitution, the legislature has the, the authority and the responsibility to draft boundaries for uh, changes in, in legislative districts and congressional districts. And and so what's going to happen with this legislation, it creates a commission and they will represent, they will draw maps and give it to the legislature. And if the legislature chooses not to use those, they have to give a reason. They're not obligated to use that. But the fact of the matter is, uh, in many states, this type of initiative has put it in the court's hand because they'll use this as a tool to get it into the courts and allow a judge to draw maps. And that's a troubling component. So if this passes, the legislature won't be able to draw its own maps. We will be able to draw our own maps. And quite frankly, constitutionally, we have to draw our own maps. Uh, but we, we can choose to use the one that's recommended by the commission, but we don't have to. But that could end up, what could happen is that they're so firm on, let's, let's say, for example, you know, that they choose to draw a, a congressional district boundary that is completely democratic in nature. And there's only certain spots in the state that are real strong democratic strongholds. Mm -hmm. And then the other three would be Republican strongholds. And let's say the legislature chooses to equalize those and try to make, make it more balanced and have try and quite frankly, you're, they're all going to be predominantly Republican or at least a majority Republican because that's just the nature of our state. And let's say that happens. And then the initiative commission chooses to disagree with that, then they can take it to a judge and take it to a court, file for an injunction, and take it through a process. Then if the judge chooses to draw the map, who knows how he'll choose to draw. But it just that really takes away the authority from the legislature if it goes that path. It does seem to be one of the big criticisms from the last round is, hey, you know, we wanted, quote unquote, competitive congressional districts. So mm -hmm. if you look at Congressional District 4 is pretty competitive. I mean, they're, that's a real neck-and-neck -neck race right there. It um, is. I mean, and Jim Matheson even won it once. Mm -hmm. 
Multiple uh, times. Yeah. So, it, you know, I, I have a hard time seeing, and it seems like that's the focus, is it's all about the congressional districts, because in 2012, the maps, when the new maps that were drawn based on that census, there really wasn't a lot of contention about the state level maps, was there? Didn't seem there wasn't. Yet. There wasn't uh, a lot of contention about that. Um, again, uh, that's in the hands of the legislature. That's what our founders wanted it to be for the state in the people that uh, elect the legislatures, uh, legislators to office. Uh, they should have the power to create those maps. There is, a, you know, there is a drive to try to get more Democrats in the legislature. There's no getting around it. Um, the reality is that even with some significant change in the number of Democrats in the legislature, the Republicans would still hold a supermajority. But time changes. You know, it wasn't that long ago when the Democrats controlled the legislature in the state of Utah. Of course, times have changed, and it's, it's flipped the other way now. But yeah, just just a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> I know that, um, you know, the, that's always the key, the buzzword is competitive districts, competitive districts. What what kind of framework is used if in the legislature to draw the districts? Well, responsible, you know, one, on the congressional districts, you know, it actually got right down to the, like one person, you know, literally. I mean, there, mm -hmm. each district was drawn up with equal proportions of the state population. And the Senate district is pretty simple. You know, you take the population and divide it by 29, and that's the number. Mm -hmm. And then you start figuring out, okay, how can we do that? For example, my district, uh, before, I held, before I held this district, and previous to me, it was about a six or seven county district. It's now three. It includes uh, Beaver, all of, Iron, all of Beaver, all of Iron, well, almost all of Beaver, just a, just a small population not. So basically all of Beaver, all of Iron, and a portion of Washington County. Now, you think about it, and Washington County is growing faster than Iron County. It's currently, it's 10% Beaver, 50% Iron, 40% Washington. That could easily flip to where you have a 40% Iron, 60% Washington seat, and then Iron could possibly lose this Senate seat, you know, basically forever. Mm -hmm. So when they start drawing those maps, it comes down to pretty, pretty much one person. So they... For example, if it's 95,000, which is our number now, what's, what's yours, John? 36.5 uh, or something? Yeah. 36.5 yeah, for a house seat. Yep. You know, if, whatever the population, you divide that up, and they really try to carve it out. The challenge with that is is that sometimes you'll split neighborhoods, sometimes you'll split mm -hmm. communities, and, and that can be a challenge. That was one of the phrases constantly tossed around was, you know, communities of interest. Keep communities of interest together. Mm -hmm. But sounds like without some changes um, – state law that just won't be possible see at one time um cedar city was divided mike noel uh had part of cedar city now um my district is located all within iron county and uh, brad last from hurricane jumps over me and picks up brian head Parowin, paraguna summit and enic <laughs> And then I have Cedar City and West, uh, the valleys and West and Canaraville. Yeah. So, yeah, there's been a lot of thought and work gone into these. Absolutely. One thing I'd like to point out, too, there is that uh, this happened uh, right before I came in. Um, I came in in, in 13, um, and it had been done in 12. Mm hmm and uh, so they say that the average legislator is uh, like seven to eight years. And so, boy, it seems like uh, it's working. It's working well. And uh, I think we've been transparent, and they're worried about transparency and fairness. I think that's being shown. It's being exhibited. It's all in public meetings. So... I mean, we're doing the best we can. Uh, no, another challenge, too, is between 2000 and 2012, the percentage of Republicans in the state actually increased, um, making it even harder to draw, you know, more competitive districts. I know that's, you know, that's, do you feel like if we drew intentionally, like, 50-50 districts, that that would cause a lot more problems? 
Well, it'd be impossible in some cases to draw 50. There, in some of the areas in like the Salt Lake Valley, you could draw a 50-50 district, but you get into southern Utah and rural Utah, you couldn't do it. There's just not enough Democrats to do that. Mm -hmm. Well, that is evidenced by they didn't run anyone for any of our county positions here. Mm -hmm. and, right. Um, <laughs> I feel a little bad for Zeno Perry and his um, plywood spray paint signs. Yeah. You know, just kind of shows the weakness here. Um, do you see that if those kinds of districts were being drawn in Salt Lake County, they would be in ridiculous shapes? Um, boy, that's a good question. That I, is a good question. The, the, the prime predominance of the Democratic population, the, the, the stronghold Democrats in the, in the Salt Lake Valley are on the East Bench, you know, basically from oh, Sandy, maybe just a little bit north of that, you know, up through the avenues, you know, mm -hmm. that's the area. And then Carbon County has, has always been significantly in a, a democratic stronghold. Yeah. So it would probably be pretty challenging to draw a lot of competitive districts out of those areas then. Yeah, you could. Yeah, you could some, but it, in some of those cases, quite frankly, it'd be a difficult to draw a 50-50 boundary because it is so predominantly democratic. Yeah. It'd almost be impossible to draw it up on that, on the East Bench, you know, for example. Yeah, Salt Lake would have the same problem as, say, St. George. Yeah. You, you couldn't find enough, enough to draw a district like that. No. At least not without it being an obvious, you know, weird snaking shape going yeah. clear up into like Bountiful or something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I appreciate you both coming on today and talking about these ballot questions. Are there any parting thoughts you'd like to leave? Yeah, I do. Um, so you've listened to John today and, and you can tell that he spent his time well in the legislature and he's he's been he's picked up on things. He's very adept and he's been a really a good legislator and and, you know, quite frankly, I'm not very happy with him because he's retiring this year. <laughs> and uh, but I just want to just tell him how much I appreciated working with him and how much what a pleasure it's been. And and certainly wish him and his wife and family well in your future endeavors. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's been a privilege representing our district here in Iron County uh, with Evan. Evan uh, does a very good job where he's well known in the House and now in the Senate and in leadership in the Senate and for appropriations. Very important that we reelect uh, Evan for his position. And I would encourage our people to get out. These ballot initiatives are important. They need to study them. They need to read them. They need to ask questions. And then last of all, they need to vote. Uh, to make their voice be known. Because we'll see how accurate the polls right now are after November. You know, this may be one other parting thought. You know, John stimulated a thought there. You know, he and I have kind of talked about this in the legislature. When we get a bill that we're kind of unclear on, we've kind of t adopted the when in doubt, vote no. <laughs> <laughs> this might not be a bad year to try that on some of those initiatives. <laughs> If someone can, can still come back in a few years, and maybe they'll maybe they'll have a much stronger position at that point. That's right. Yeah. Um, you know, you never you never know that, that that may just be what they need to to come up with a better better proposal. Of, almost like it's a, a legislative approach to yeah. doing things. <laughs> well, again, thank you very much for coming on the show. Um, thank you. You know, everyone out there listening, uh, make sure you go and subscribe in your favorite podcast app. We'll also have a video up on YouTube. Um, and if you have any feedback, please feel free to go ahead and send it our way. You've been listening to Color Country Politics, a production in cooperation with Utah Politico Hub and graciously sponsored by Century 21 Prestige Realty at 121 North Main Street, Cedar City. Special thanks to Amoeba Crew for use of their song, Background Indie Rock, licensed under Creative Commons. Subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever fine podcasts are found. Also, check out our YouTube channel where we post video of our interviews. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Google+, and our website at www.colorcountrypolitics.com. <laughs>